Okay, so then you were, uh, that lady said something about the yeah. baby crying. Yeah, so, so there was this baby that came through the checkout lane when I was working at Target and, you know, screaming his head off. And I had never really encountered such a thing before with my, with just the peculiarities of my upbringing. And, uh, and, she, and she saw that I was kind of shaken up by this baby crying. And uh, she looks at me and says, you know, you've, you've never been around many children crying, have you? And I said, no, ma'am, no, I've not. And she replies, it's the music of angels, you know. And, and I just, I looked at her and I blurted out, you must be Catholic. Because, you know, the love of babies, the invocation of angels, the seeing of good in amidst the bad suffering. And I was like, that must have come from a Catholic imagination. And so that was something that, like, it, it taught me, it reminded me, I guess as you could say, there is some sort of hidden beauty within the Catholic faith that can make you wise like that old woman was. So that was sort of like the first little anchor point that kept me Catholic when, you know, if you look at my history in college and stuff like that, there's no good reason why I should have emerged a Catholic. Uh, but that was one little anchor point right there. Um, and that was in high school, That right? was high school. All these were high school. Okay. And then... What was the other? There were there were two more. The other one was my first Ash Wednesday because okay. I didn't even know that Ash Wednesday was our thing until I was like a junior in high school. But I remember my first <laughs> our thing as in a Catholic. This thing. isn't right, a Catholic right, thing. Right. Um, but when you uh, told me that, I was like pretty shocked. But no. I was like, oh my gosh! But it happens. It happens. It is what it is. I mean, right. I, I'd never been to an Ash Wednesday mass before. I didn't know what this thing was that people were doing. Sure. Um, and uh, and so I remember my first time getting ashes on Ash Wednesday, and I go to school, and suddenly I'm one of those weirdos with the smudges on the head. And uh, but I was getting sort of like the guy nod from all these guys that I didn't even know. And it was like at sort Carmel of, High School. Yeah, at Carmel High School. It's sort of like you know I never my family was uh, I never had any brothers before, but you know I kind of, what it did was is it woke me up to the family aspect of the Catholic faith that you know when that my fellow Catholic men are uh, they are my brothers in a very real sense and that's and just that just opening up that door and that guy with the smudge and the in the and the guy nod that every guy knows what that is <laughs> I didn't know what the guy nod was I guess I can kind of visualize the guy nod it's it, it's a it's just a little nudge of the head in, in lieu of saying hello or waving okay it's just a little nudge of the head um, and, uh, and like acknowledging each other yeah. and, and he had and he had the ashes and you had yeah. the ashes and he it, was kind of giving you that. It's a sign of mutual acknowledgement yeah and it's and that actually meant a lot to me was that uh, was that the is that the Catholic faith and that bizarre thing that we did turned uh, turned strangers into brothers and uh, on a side note I once uh, I was biking down the Monon Trail and as a social experiment I decided to give the guy nod to everyone I saw okay. male, male and female alike okay and and the guys all got it, and the women thought I was like some kind of dangerous human being. It's like, why is why is he motioning with his head at at me? It's like there, so yeah. So the guy nod to other guys was like, "Yo, dude, this is cool," and the yeah, guy nod to a, to a female is like, "That guy's a creep." It's it, well, even worse is if a girl initiates the guy nod to you, and it's like. <laughs> What's the third one? Uh, the third one was um, I had a, a youth minister who was telling a story about her her dad, um, and I should add that like when I was in when I was in uh, CCD and youth ministry, most of it was just songs and learning prayers. Okay, there was nothing really serious about it that would compel you to say yes. The Catholic faith is something I need to devote my life to. You know, they meant well, but there really just wasn't a lot of meat to it. But she told this story about her father. For a person like you that's like needs meat, right? And I think all people need meat, don't they? I think there wasn't meat for anybody. Because as I look back, most all of the people who were in that CCD class are not Catholics anymore. Well, we need to go get them, Stephen. It, it just didn't... One of my rules of youth ministry is if you aim for high school youth ministry, you hit middle school. Mm, as gotcha. soon as you start talking down to an age group, yeah. you immediately start talking way too far down. Yeah. And so what? And and that was something that I. It's subtle, but people don't pick up on it, and it just came off as kid stuff. That's my critique of my CCD classes. It just all came off as kid stuff. 
So uh, then tell me about the, the girl uh, that had so, the story. So the, the, the woman who had the story, she was the lady who was, she was the youth minister at the parish. Okay. And she was telling a story about it was either her father or father-in-law or stepdad or something of that nature. And he was in what we call, uh, euphemistically in the Catholic circles, an, an irregular marital situation, which means that he had divorced and remarried outside the church. Okay. But he still went to the Catholic church and he didn't receive communion. And so people would say to him, why are you going to this church that will not admit you to communion, that doesn't accept you and your relationship? And he said, I would rather be 10% Catholic than 100% anything else. And that phrase is stuck with me forever because it's like G.K. Chesterton said, anything that is worth doing is worth doing poorly. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it, it is, what that says is that if something is really important, you're just going to you're just gonna do it. Okay? And so he recognized that the Catholic faith, come what may, is important enough that it's worth doing poorly. And, and that actually meant something to me was, okay, here's a guy that the Catholic faith really means something in his life. It means something to his identity. And does it mean something to me? That, and, and that was, those little three things, you know, it's, it's never the arguments that do it. Right. Okay? Right. As an apologist, you can, you can get too hopped up on good arguments and think that that's what's going to carry the day. Right. Good arguments are, of course, important. You know, St. Paul delivered a lot of good arguments. But many times the things that really matter are these bizarre, you know, idiosyncratic things that kind of make the difference for you. Uh, can I tell you another boring story? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Fire. This is one of the few times I've ever just cleanly won an argument, okay? One of like, maybe the only time in my life. Um, it, was, it had nothing to do with the Catholic faith. And I had a friend of mine who was, he was a Christian, he was a very committed Christian of a different sort, he wasn't a Catholic, and we were arguing about the Purdue paper uh, quota policy, okay? okay. Back before, Did you go to Purdue? I went to Purdue. Okay. Um, so our gen, my class at Purdue w was just, we were just misfits, we were just, and you could go on and on for all the ways that Purdue had to react to how terrible our class was. But one of the things that we thought was great was just stealing paper from the printers. We would just open up the printer and just take paper out. And we would tell ourselves that we're doing a great thing uh, because we're saving them ink. Okay. <laughs> because we only took the paper. We didn't, you know, we could have printed it out, but we just, no, we just took the, pr the paper and we're, now we'll just print it out on our, on our own printers. And so we, we told ourselves that stealing paper from the printers is okay. And so me and this other Christian guy, we're going at this for forever. And I was like, no, you're stealing paper. You're taking paper and you're putting it in your printer. It isn't yours. You're not printing it out on the, on the computer labs. You're just taking paper. And he was like, no, I'm saving their ink. And this went on and on and on and on. And he was making all kinds of economic arguments about it and stuff like that. And I said, and at the end, I said, all my arguments had failed. Mm -hmm. And I said to him at the end, fine. I know in my conscience that it's stealing. And I'm going to follow my conscience, and you can follow your economic argument, and we'll see who is commended by God at the end of the day. And he replied to me, he stopped, and he replied to me, Stephen O'Keefe, you are a righteous man, and I will never steal paper again. Wow. And I was like, we were just arguing for three hours. <laughs> like, what was that about? It, it, but that taught me that, you know, arguments are many times just like thumb wars. You know, it's you can do it forever and it doesn't accomplish much, but many times it just something else has to push a person through the door. And that is an important lesson to be humble as an apologist. Your job is to clear out intellectual hurdles. You're there to you're you're the groundskeeper. You know, you're there just to trim back thorn bushes and to and to make the pathway clear again. But your arguments themselves are oftentimes not going to move people along. And I have to recognize in my case it didn't. Mm -hmm. In my case it didn't. Um, for me, so what? Yeah. yeah. So what? So what did it for you? Were those? Was it those three things that just kind of kept ringing in your ears? It was, because it was those, you don't get to where you're at right now. How, yeah. how did it happen? I'm still. You still haven't answered that question. It was me. those three things that kind of kept me Catholic, and then it was the witness of Deacon Paul Lunsford, really putting everything together in a in a very persuasive and authoritative way. Seeing him live out the Catholic faith in an intentional way I'd never seen before. Knowing from him that it was possible, and then. Um, and then coming out of college and then starting youth ministry, 
and okay, I've got all this head knowledge, and all of it really, really makes sense, and it all checks out intellectually, but now I have to start living it because life is about to get serious for me. I'm going to start being some kind of example for, for high schoolers, and I'm going to be a dad someday, and I have to be a, now I have to be like a husband or something. And it's like, so it's, it's sort of like, a, you know, the situations themselves draw the virtue out of you, or, or God gives you the grace in those moments to, to change yourself and take it more seriously. And so, you know, it's, that's where the change comes from. I don't have a real conversion moment. People can point to a conversion moment. I can't. Uh, for me, it's sort of, it's, you know, the grace of baptism got poured out over time, and, and you just have to find yourself in your vocation and then just live it to the best of your ability. Um, and my vocation is first as a husband, second as a father, third as, uh, as, as an apologist, you could say. Um, and I think a lot of times people, when they when they do ministry, they kind of get all they get those all mixed up because they get all excited about their you know whatever their ministry is, and mm -hmm. they forget that well, what's my state in life, you know? And that that's what I love about the Catholic Church. It really gives you, you know, that ordered life mm -hmm. in the sense of you know you have that order. Okay, God first. I'm a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. You know, so my relationship with God, my relationship with my with my spouse. You know my responsibilities as a parent mm -hmm. um so that's what i love about being catholic because it really does help us mm -hmm. be who we're supposed to be yeah so um we'll have more questions for um stephen o'keefe the local apologist on, on another episode but i think we covered quite a bit we, today. we really did and it's, we been went, a, and it's been a lot of fun yeah.